In the first part of our documentary on Stalin, we have seen his journey from Georgia to total power in the Soviet Union. In this second part, we will look at the consolidation of his rule, his leadership in the Second World War, and his final days during the Cold War. After the process of land collectivization, the expected happened. As Stalin seized the peasants' grain, the peasants' production decreased from 1930 onwards. Each harvest was worse than the last, leading the grain collectors to use ever more ruthless methods. To counteract these actions by peasants and pursue his industrialization goal, Stalin resorted to the simplest and safest course, the confiscation of peasants' land and the transformation of peasants into workers on state-run farms. The method used is better known as collectivization, involving the forced large-scale movement of peasants onto collective farms, the kolkhozes. The violence used to affect collectivization was soon met with resistance. Throughout 1926 and 1927, the authorities tracked down only 26 incidents of large-scale anti-unrest in rural areas. In 1929, there were over 1,300 such incidents, involving 244,000 participants. In January and February in 1930 alone, there were about 1,500 incidents, with 324,000 participants. Stalin did not immediately react. To calm things down, he temporarily backed down, publicized the benefits and progress of collectivization in the press, allowed some peasants to own part of the land and other property, and permitted the reopening of churches that had been closed during collectivization. The peasant demonstrations did not subside. In March, between 1.5 and 2 million peasants rioted. The uprisings were especially pervasive in Ukraine. The protests were disorderly and without much firepower. The response was carried out with machine guns and even cannons. Mass arrests of uprising leaders sapped resistance. Collectivization was the bedrock of Stalin's dictatorship. Every other feature of the Stalinist system can be traced back to it. Large-scale violence against the country's largest class called for a major apparatus of oppression, topped by a system of camps and exile sites. Between 1930 and 1932, hundreds of thousands of people were shot. Almost 700,000 are believed to have been executed and more than 2 million people were sent into exile, sometimes simply thrown into open fields. The terrible living conditions, grueling labor, and starvation caused many casualties, especially among children. In these years, agricultural yields plummeted. Due to industrialization, the rural budget became smaller and smaller. Consequently, the population's rations were also dwindling. Between 1931 to 1933, the Soviet Union endured the Great Famine. The expected result of the five-year plan fell far short of expectations. The haste meant that much industrial equipment was damaged, and the output of consumer goods was practically zero. According to Oleg Klevniuk, between 1932 and 1933, the Great Famine claimed between 5 to 7 million people. The Stalinist policy of the Great Leap was its primary cause. Moreover, Stalin's decisions made this tragedy worse rather than lessening it. Famine was the inevitable result of industrialization and collectivization. The Kolkhozes failed to meet the necessary production, and the rural workers were robbed of incentives to work besides suffering from starvation. The state's interest was different from that of the peasants, who stashed away the grain to feed themselves. Stalin could have used a tax system instead of confiscating the entire production, so he would have incentivized the peasants to produce. He could have also cut down on the export of grain or bought it from abroad. However, Stalin refused both options. Only in 1933 did he take some action, reducing industrial production. But it was already too late. Although the entire country experienced mass starvation and repression, Ukraine and the Northern Caucasus were the worst affected. In these two important regions of the Soviet Union, the punishing policy of grain requisitioning and terror was most brutally applied. Two overlapping reasons explain Stalin's focus on these areas. The Ukrainian and Caucasus regions provided up to half of all the grain collected by the state, but they handed out 40% less in 1932 to 1933 compared to the previous year. Stalin wanted his grain, and was angered that they were not supplying as much as they needed. 
The second reason is that Stalin regarded the 1932 crisis as a continuation of the war against the peasantry, and a way to cement the collectivization results. Ukraine had been against it since 1930 and, on top of that, it was right next to Poland, so he feared the Poles would profit from the situation. Even with all this terror, production was negligible. Continuing along this path would mean bankruptcy. Arrests and exile were not working. In 1933, the massive network of camps and prisons was unable to cope with the growing flow of detainees. New camps had to be built for at least 2 million deportees, but the money was stretched, and only 270,000 people could be arrested. In 1931, Japan invaded Manchuria. In 1933, Hitler came to power in Germany, and Stalin was forced to find alliances with Western countries. In 1933, the Politburo hashed a plan for the USSR to enter the League of Nations, teaming up with France and Poland against Germany. But, for this, the Soviets had to show signs of having functioning institutions. The grain seizure was quickly aborted, replaced by quotas, where the peasants had a target. If they exceeded it, they would keep the surplus to sell. Peasants were also permitted to have small plots of land for their own farming, and these farms would eventually account for a large part of the domestic consumption of grain and meat. From 1933, under the second five-year plan, the economy was rerouted. There was even some talk of a thriving life. To encourage labor, a policy prohibiting arbitrary imprisonment was issued, and some prisoners were released. However, in 1934, the OGPU secret police was abrogated, replaced by the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, better known as the NKVD which brought together the more harmless branches of law, order, and public security. Although there were fewer arrests in 1934, the victims of repression were still in the hundreds of thousands. Kirov, Stalin's friend and ally, would be assassinated that same year, prompting a return of persecutions. The sober years of the regime brought prosperity to the Soviet people. The food situation improved, industrial production increased, financial incentives stimulated productivity, and Stalin launched the slogan, Life has become better, life has become happier. Between 1935 and early 1936, the persecution of former opportunists were matched by rearrangements in the highest echelons of power. The assassination of Kirov bolstered the position of three fearless young men, Nikolai Yezhov, Andrei Zhadanov, and Nikita Khrushchev. The purges took place, show trials were set up, the goal was to weed out the old party members to bring in young, new ranks, subservient to Stalin. Alongside the Great Terror going on in the USSR, Stalin was watching an imminent war developing. Hitler had taken office in 1933. The Western powers were following an appeasement policy with the Nazis. The Japanese were attacking the eastern borders, and the Spanish Civil War broke out in July 1936. The Spanish Republicans suffered a string of defeats and Stalin became directly involved. Some Spanish reports said that the losses were caused by treachery within the headquarters. The author connects this event with an increase in persecutions carried out by Stalin, pointing out that he did not want these treasonous episodes to occur in his territory, which is why he authorized a range of persecutions. Accounts of treason and anarchy in Spain were a key component in the propaganda campaign to intensify vigilance and fight enemies within the Soviet Union. In the late 1930s, Western leaders opted to appease Hitler rather than form an alliance with Stalin, a development that reached its peak with the Munich Agreement. On September 30, 1938, the leaders of Great Britain and France, Neville Chamberlain and Edward Daladier, entered an agreement with Hitler and Mussolini, handing over to Germany the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia an area mainly populated by German speakers. Czechoslovakia was forced to accept this crippling pact. The Soviet Union was simply ignored, despite having signed mutual assistance agreements with France and Czechoslovakia. Stalin was thus excluded from the European Great Powers policies. Stalin took it as a personal insult, denouncing France and England's attitudes. He simultaneously moved the Red Army troops. Hitler, confident that no one would stop him, took over the entire Czechoslovak territory. Even the most optimistic observers at the time realized that Munich had made war virtually inevitable. 
The spring and summer of 1939 were a time of desperate diplomatic maneuvering and negotiations. Nobody trusted anybody, and all sought to pull off some maneuver to overthrow the other party. What featured more prominently in Stalin's mind during this period? Pressuring his Western partners or tapping into the possibility of colluding with the Nazis? According to Oleg, Stalin's attitude toward the Germans tended to swing between approval and vexation. But the Soviet leader did not trust Hitler and undertook strong anti-Nazi propaganda in the Soviet Union. Whatever Stalin's true inclinations, it was Hitler who drew the initiative in bringing about a German-Soviet non-aggression pact. As soon as the German Chancellor had decided upon an invasion of Poland, set for September the 1st, Soviet cooperation was required. He took the required steps to foster a rapprochement between the two countries. On August the 21st, Stalin got a personal correspondence from Hitler, overtly hinting at his plans for Poland and expressing an urgent desire to conclude a non-aggression pact within a few days. Hitler asked Stalin to meet von Ribbentrop in Moscow as early as the next day, or at the very least on August the 23rd. On August the 21st, Molotov, Stalin's foreign minister, handed Stalin's reply to the German ambassador in Moscow. Von Ribbentrop could go to Moscow on the 23rd. Stalin was there on the day to welcome the German ambassador, and each party got what they wanted. Besides the non-aggression pact, Stalin urged the drafting of a secret protocol, dictating that Germany and the Soviet Union would divide Eastern Europe. Poland's easternmost portion, including parts of Ukraine and Belarus, Latvia, Estonia, and Finland, were to be recognized as integral parts of the Soviet domain. Western Poland and Lithuania would be left to Germany. History calls it the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which was, in fact, an agreement between Stalin and Hitler. We may say that it was a pragmatic step by Stalin. Even though it was a poorly judged matter from a moral standpoint, it was not so different from the Western democracies that had signed the Munich Agreement. Furthermore, this deal with the Western powers led Hitler eastward. Now, with this new treaty with the Soviet Union, Hitler would be free to shift his forces westward. Stalin had sent a the tables have turned message to the capitalist nations of Western Europe. For Stalin, the pact provided a risk-free expansion for the Soviet Union and a chance to create a buffer territory between his country and the war about to be unleashed in Europe. To top it all off, there were the Japanese. In the spring of 1939, conflicts were already starting to break out between the Soviet and Japanese troops in Mongolia. The pact with Germany was a blow to Japan, already suffering losses and unable to count on its ally. Germany invaded Poland on September 1, 1939. Poland's allies, Britain and France, replied with a declaration of war and World War II was underway. The Nazis swept through Poland with hardly any opposition. The British and French forces that came out of defense of Poland took too long to assemble. Also, they seemed in no great hurry to fight. On the other side, keeping its end of the deal, the Red Army invaded Poland on September the 17th. Stalin justified the invasion as to free the peoples of Western Ukraine and Belarus, which had been taken by Poland in 1921. But after being annexed, these regions went through the same process as other regions had already experienced, land confiscation, suppression of the capitalist system, and persecution of opponents. As for Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, Stalin caved in and took a diplomatic initiative by establishing military bases in these Baltic countries, but maintaining their independence. According to him, we will not try to Sovietize them. The time will come when they will need to do it themselves. The stumbling block he encountered at the time was Finland. Apart from a military base, the Nordic country was required to provide land near Leningrad, previously named St. Petersburg. Finland emphatically refused the Soviet demands. Stalin resorted to brute force. The battle was extremely lopsided. Finland was a country of only 4 million inhabitants, with a tiny territory, having only 26 tanks against the 1,500 owned by the Soviets. Stalin expected the invasion to be a cakewalk. However, this conflict, known as the Winter War, suddenly escalated. The Finns bravely resisted, and, with a protracted conflict, the Soviet Union was ousted from the League of Nations, while Britain and France considered helping Finland. With his negative repercussion, Stalin dropped his plans. In March 1940, 
he signed the peace treaty. The Red Army lost about 130,000 soldiers, and more than 200,000 were wounded. The Finnish losses were considerably less, 23,000 killed and 44,000 wounded. The war, a major defeat for the Soviet Union and for Stalin personally, laid bare weaknesses in every element of the Soviet war machine. Historians have suggested that this conflict inspired Hitler to push forward his invasion of the Soviet Union. In the West, Nazi Germany was busy occupying several Western European countries, forcing France to surrender within weeks. France's quick and ignominious downfall radically changed the global picture. A colossal threat now loomed over the Soviet Union. As busy as he was with the Sovietization of the annexed territories, as well as the shadow of Nazi Germany sweeping over Western Europe, Stalin could not forget his faraway enemies. In August 1940, Leon Trotsky was killed in Mexico on Stalin's orders. An NKVD agent who had broken into Trotsky's inner circle murdered the former opposition leader with an ice pick. In November 1940, Hungary, Romania, and Slovakia joined the Axis, followed by Bulgaria in March 1941. In April, Germany invaded Greece and Yugoslavia. By December 1940, Hitler had already enacted plans to invade the Soviet Union in May 1941. Stalin's only remaining ally was his own people. The Soviet leaders spent the last months prior to Hitler's march on the Soviet Union building up his power and undertaking tremendous efforts to bolster the country's military might. During the pre-war period, the Soviet Union made a desperate attempt to increase war production and modernize it at the same time. By 1940, military production was two and a half times greater than it had been in 1937. In 1940, the Soviets had 25,000 tanks, of which only 1,500 were of a modern design. They had 18,000 fighter planes, a quarter of which were a modern design. Despite the speed with which the project of modernizing the army was employed, it was far from being completed. Some historians report that Stalin did not consider the possibility of Hitler's attack in 1941. He imagined that Hitler would not want to wage war on two fronts and end the economic partnership established by the German-Soviet pact. But in June 1941, reality knocked on the door. Stalin was stunned by the attack, guessing it was an attack by German generals without Hitler's consent. He sent Molotov to check on the German embassy, while the Red Army generals waited for the order to counterattack. Molotov returned with confirmation of the German attack and Stalin prepared his defensive front. The first day of fighting was catastrophic. According to official Soviet sources, the Red Army lost 1,200 planes on June the 22nd, many of which were destroyed at the airports. The Germans also overran several kilometers on the borders. A week later, the Belarusian capital was taken. Stalin was struck by the invasion. He spent a few days dazed and unresponsive. Molotov was forced to adopt the first steps and even set up a state defense committee. The Soviet leader only returned on July the 3rd, when he delivered a radio speech to the nation. In the address, Stalin adopted a friendly and conciliatory tone. He called upon the nation to fight the Nazis stressing that it was a matter of life and death. Between the beginning of the war and January the 1st, 1942, 4.5 members of the Red Army and Navy were killed, wounded, or captured. We may attribute this disaster to inadequate readiness for war, the enemy surprise attack, and the German Army's military and organizational advantages. Stalin's military command and political leadership were also lacking. The Red Army leaders had scant knowledge of how to stop an enemy advance or minimize casualties by using strategic retreats to previously arranged positions. Retreat was forbidden. To enforce this, Stalin issued an order at the front. In case of desertion, treason, or similar, the penalties would be imprisonment, execution, or confiscation of the state pension. From August, the Red Army started to contain the German onslaught, which was already in Ukraine. They were closing in on the three major capitals, Leningrad in the north, Moscow in the center, and Kiev in the south. Time was working against the Germans, and Hitler's blitzkrieg was finally being halted. Britain and the United States started to negotiate aid with the Soviets. Between September the 29th and October the 1st, 1941, a conference of the three powers was held in Moscow. 
Both countries would provide the Soviets with tanks, trucks, planes, and other armaments, as well as food, of course. The worst defeat of the war up to that point occurred between September the 14th and 15th in Kiev. 452,700 Soviet troops were besieged. The retreat did not take place, and these soldiers were killed or captured. The destruction of this massive force only strengthened the German strategic advance. Reports indicate that Stalin himself confided in Zhukov and that the defeat was his fault. The defeat in Ukraine further endangered Leningrad. By September the 8th, the city was surrounded. The next day, the Germans unleashed a new offensive that brought the front line to the city's doorstep. By the end of September, the advance deadlocked. The siege of Leningrad, one of the most terrifying episodes of World War II, and one of the most haunting testimonies to the bravery of the Soviet people began. Throughout the siege, hundreds of thousands of civilians died from starvation or from German bombing. By October, the Germans were drawing closer to Moscow. By the 14th, they were only a few kilometers away. An emergency evacuation was prepared. However, not all the city was evacuated. The German advance was stalled. By the end of October, Soviet troops had halted the enemy's advance in the central sector. The Red Army's resolute fighting, which had suffered heavy losses, the German troops' exhaustion, and the autumn's melting mud and snow helped bog down the invasion. Having stayed in the capital, Stalin commenced to prepare an improved defense strategy for Moscow. He was also extremely clever at propaganda. With the November hush, he staged a military parade commemorating the 1917 revolution and gave a speech to the nation, the second after the start of the war. The Germans attempted a new offensive to take the capital in December, but it was thwarted. In January, the Soviets mounted a counteroffensive and pushed the enemy back to between 100 and 250 kilometers from Moscow. There was finally something real to celebrate. In May 1942, the Soviets experienced another defeat, this time in Crimea. Hitler's next offensive targeted the Caucasus and the Volga. By July, the Germans were pushing towards Stalingrad. Stalin was aggravated by the lack of initiative from the other allies and wanted a second front to split the German army. On August the 12th, Stalin met face to face with Churchill in Moscow. The British Prime Minister attributed the lack of a new front to losses in North Africa and the Mediterranean. Stalin was vexed when he heard this excuse and told Churchill not to be afraid to face Hitler. The British PM reminded the Soviet leader that he had fought the Germans alone for a year. Finally, Churchill spoke of his plans to land in North Africa, aiming to invade France. The atmosphere settled down on his final day in Moscow. About the same time, the Germans took Stalingrad and were getting closer to the Caucasus oil fields. According to official Soviet statistics, from January to October 1942 alone, 5.5 million Red Army soldiers were killed, wounded, or captured. However, the gradual formation of new armies and the heroic efforts of the Stalingrad and Caucasus defenders allowed the front to stabilize. Hitler's manpower shortage, as he concurrently pursued multiple difficult objectives, also helped to change the momentum. Within Stalingrad's ruins, Soviet soldiers fought German divisions in a close battle, it was all by appearances a rerun of late 1941. The slaughtered German armies could no longer advance. Having inflicted heavy losses, the Red Army now held a window to seize the initiative. The question was how and when to attack. It came on the outskirts of Stalingrad. The famous Soviet victory was the pinnacle of heroic efforts and massive sacrifices throughout the country. It showed that Stalin, too, had finally learned from past defeats. The well-prepared Soviet offensive outside the city, named after Stalin, began on November the 19th, 1942. A few days later, the 330,000-man German force in Stalingrad, led by General, later Field Marshal Frederick Paulus, was surrounded. After dashing German attempts to break the siege, Soviet forces finally coaxed the enemy to capitulate on February the 2nd, 1943. The drawn-out battle ultimately cost the Germans hundreds of thousands of soldiers and officers. More than 90,000 were taken prisoner, including Paulus himself. The victory was a turning point in the war. From then on, the Soviets pounced on the Nazis. After the much heralded victory, the Soviets went on the offensive, successfully liberating Leningrad in January 1943. 
the Soviet offensive westward was stopped by the Germans, who mounted an offensive at Kursk. The Battle of Kursk began on July 5, 1943, and continued until August 23. The battle had enormous figures. Four million soldiers were deployed on both sides. It was one of the largest tank battles, and the Soviet side had twice as many units as the Germans. The Nazi leader still expected that the superior organization and up-to-date weaponry, especially the Tiger and Panther tanks, could win them another triumph. This could have been the outcome, had they not also faced superior numbers and a more mature and better prepared force. After wearing down the enemy over a week of ferocious fighting based on a defensive position, the Red Army counterattacked. During the climax of the counteroffensive, Stalin visited the front for the first and last time in early August 1943. It was a key display to uphold his reputation as an engaged and compassionate leader, just like the time he stayed in Moscow when the city was about to be taken. The Battle of Kursk brought an end to any possibility of German victory. However, most of the Nazi forces escaped the siege and withdrew to defensive lines in Ukraine, the Crimea, and the Army Group Center. German forces shifted to a defensive posture, engaging in only intermittent counterattacks. The Soviets gradually regained territory at the cost of many lost lives. By November 1943, they had retaken Kiev. But the bloody war would not end so soon. Meanwhile, the other Allies were achieving important victories. The British had taken North Africa, and Mussolini's Italy was barely holding on, while the Americans were winning decisive victories over the Japanese. Germany was being shelled in its territory, as well as losing several submarines. However, Stalin required the opening of a second front in France. He wanted to relieve his army. Churchill and Roosevelt agreed. In November 1943, the Allies met in Tehran, Stalin's proposed location. This concession by Roosevelt and Churchill at least slightly eased the tension on both sides in delaying an invasion. The US and Britain promised to open a second front in northern France in May 1944. Aside from other issues, Stalin had every reason to walk away happy. By 1944, the Allies knew that Germany would lose the war. The question was when and how many more lives would be lost. The Soviets were steadily gaining ground on the long Soviet-German front, and Stalin took advantage of these victories to spread a powerful propaganda campaign. 60,000 prisoners were paraded through Moscow, and people took to the streets, shouting, Death to Hitler, and Death to Fascism. The Red Army and his commanders, led by Stalin, grew increasingly confident, boosted by the wealth of their resources and the experience acquired over years of catastrophe, and, ultimately, victory. The early 1945 victories brought the Soviet leadership into a favorable position to bargain with the Allies for the post-war future. The Red Army was entering German territory, which resisted and even tried to counterattack. The first years of defeat taught Stalin prudence. He patiently waited for the right moment to strike. In February 1945, a new meeting between the three Allied leaders took place in Yalta, Crimea. The future of Germany and the redefinition of the European map were debated. The deadlock was Poland. Stalin had handpicked the country and did not want to concede to Great Britain. One could already taste the Cold War atmosphere brewing. On April 16, 1945, Stalin stepped up the pace to take Berlin, one month ahead of schedule. Two million soldiers joined forces to take the German capital. The overwhelming numerical superiority and the high morale of the victors sealed the Third Reich's fate. Early in the morning of May the 1st, Stalin was notified by an urgent telephone message from Marshal Zhukov that Hitler had committed suicide in his Berlin bunker the previous day. On May the 2nd, the Berlin garrison surrendered. During the night of May the 8th to the 9th, the final surrender was drafted and signed by Germany. On June the 24th, Moscow staged a much-awaited and impressed victory parade. Then, on June the 27th, Stalin was awarded the title of Generalissimo. After festivities and celebrations, Stalin left for Germany in July, where another meeting between the three allies would take place. This was the first with American President Henry Truman, since Roosevelt had died months before. Truman was more of a hardliner and wanted to hamper the negotiations. He even told Stalin about the atomic bomb tests under development. The Soviet leader captured what he could in Europe, as well as some bases in northern China 
He also committed himself to assisting in the war against Japan. Before the troops were ready, the United States dropped the atomic bombs on Japanese territory, so as to not lose the occupied territories. Stalin ordered the Red Army to move into the territories that were rightfully theirs. In the following months, the United States and the Soviet Union would dispute parts of Japan. For the millions of Soviet citizens who survived the horrors of war, the politicians' quarrels and ambitions were peripheral. Finally at peace, the country could glimpse into the future with hope. Victory pushed Stalin into unheard of heights. The Red Army became one of the world's most powerful forces, but the post-war world would continue to test the Soviet Union's limits. The country was devastated and weakened. 27 million people died in the war, many of them young, the country's future. Famine would strike again in 1946 to 1947, and the countries that had been absorbed into the Soviet Union would continue to resist. The Soviet propaganda machine was set. Stalin was to become the chief architect of victory, and the blessings of socialism were to be exalted now that a new struggle was gradually brewing. The Cold War was more of a step-by-step -step development than an event with a clear beginning. The world leaders engaged in this process were not simply looking out for their country's essential interests, but also reacting to specific and often unexpected situations with decisions that were often illogical. Stalin was no exception. The escalation between the Allies in World War II was fostered by the stark incompatibility of their systems and their conflicting expansionist desires. Specific issues often tended to heighten the general suspicion and hostility. American nuclear monopoly and their unwillingness to allow the Russians to take over Japan were counted among the many frustrations Stalin felt when dealing with the United States. One can hardly imagine that mutual concessions could have avoided a breakdown in relations between two vastly different systems, but the capitalist countries were anti-communist. Also, the communist country wanted to broaden its sphere of influence to counter capitalism. Churchill's Iron Curtain speech in 1946 was a touchstone for this new historical period. Soon after, Truman countered Soviet attempts to gain footholds in Iran, Turkey, and Greece with a plan to help rebuild Europe, the centerpiece of which became known as the Marshall Plan. Stalin reacted by rejecting the aid offered under this plan, creating an international communist organization, the Common Form. Stalin also had to beware of the leadership within the party, some had earned considerable prestige during the war, such as Zhukov and the foreign affairs minister, Molotov. He was getting old, and there was speculation about his health. Stalin started to stir up the party leadership, bringing old friends closer to him, and cutting back popular military men who had won prominence in the war. By the end of 1946, these restructurings flattened the balance of power among Stalin's associates. The sackings, demotions, and public humiliations more or less restored the pre-war high government structure. Stalin could now leave his cronies in relative peace while he took care of the country's pressing economic troubles. He made a wide-ranging and unpopular economic reform, but it worked. In 1948, the country was free of inflation and was compensating for the budget deficit. The relative financial stability provided the conditions for industrial development. In 1948, economic data showed that the most harmful consequences of the war had been overcome. Also, the main post-war recovery targets had been achieved. Stalin was also securing the Soviet Union's control over the Eastern European satellite countries. Yet a bad example emerged. Josef Broz Tito in Yugoslavia. In the spring of 1948, he entered a rapidly escalating conflict with the Soviet Union. Stalin was facing a tough opponent. Tito was a dictator by birth, who, unlike other communist leaders, had not merely been put in power by Moscow. He had earned his position by fighting the Nazis. He was fortified further by the absence of Soviet troops in Yugoslavia. Tito wanted political independence and aspired to be a leader of the communist bloc. He turned these claims into deeds. In short, he ignored one of the basic principles of Stalinization, total submission to Moscow. Tito got stronger and dealt a painful blow to Stalin. For the first time since the quarrel with Trotsky, he was confronted with the opposition of a great leader within the communist movement. Unlike Trotsky, Tito had real power and forces to react. Tito's disobedience was not only a blow to Stalin's self-respect, but also a dangerous precedent and a crack in the monolithic Soviet bloc. Others could follow Tito's example. The first serious incident on the western side concerned Germany, 
Stalin imposed a blockade of the western sectors in Berlin, broken by air supply. In April 1949, West Germany became part of NATO. The following month, Stalin was forced to lift the blockade, and by autumn, Germany was formally divided into two separate states. Faced with threats from the West, Stalin speeded up the Sovietization process in Eastern European countries, manipulating, purging, and replacing insurgent leaders with those who obeyed his orders. Stalin's setbacks in Europe were partly offset by communism's breakthrough in Asia. On October 1, 1949, a communist victory in the long-running Chinese Civil War resulted in the proclamation of the People's Republic of China under Mao Zedong. The Soviet leadership promptly established diplomatic relations with the new government and broke all ties with the defeated Kuomintang. Stalin quickly feared that Mao would follow Tito's path, as China was too great a force to remain just another satellite. The first meeting of the two communist leaders took place on December 6, 1949. Mao had been trying to arrange a meeting with Stalin since 1948, who stonewalled his comrade until he had won the civil war. The two communist leaders had a great deal in common. Mao admired Stalin. The Soviet leader was referred to as the old man. Other than advice, Mao went on to ask for the repeal of the 1945 treaties, where the Soviet Union had seized parts of Mongolia. Stalin refused, saying that such an agreement was part of the Yalta Conference. Revoking it would give Western powers a pretext to claim Soviet lands. Mao may have had mixed feelings on this, but he remained in Russia until Stalin's 70th birthday celebrations on December 21st. However, on January 22, 1950, negotiations between the two resumed. On February 14th, the Treaty of Friendship, Alliance, and Mutual Assistance was signed in the Kremlin, along with several other complementary treaties. With these agreements, the Soviet Union brought the world's most populous nation into its bloc. The apogee of the Sino-Soviet relationship had dawned. With the USSR support, China retooled its economy and built hundreds of new factories in its most important sectors. The Korean War, which broke out shortly after Mao's visits, fortified the bond between the two regimes, especially its military aspect. However, there was tension between the surface, already evident during Mao's visit. Claims of common ideological goals and unity against the same enemy could not hide the differences based on differing national interests. The coming of power of the Chinese communists was just the beginning of a convoluted relationship in which the two countries coveted the leading role in the international communist movement. Stalin's deal would last until China's economy grew again and ceased to rely on the USSR. The communist victory in China coincided with another significant event. In late August 1949, having committed enormous resources to developing its nuclear power, the Soviet Union conducted its first atomic bomb test. Despite its importance to the Soviet Union as a military power, the nuclear bomb did not make Stalin ecstatic. He knew that the war arsenal was not enough. He kept his pragmatism and caution towards the West, even in the first indirect conflict between the two blocs, the Korean War. The Korean War escalated international tensions and boosted the arms race. According to official figures, the army, which had been reduced to 2.9 million soldiers in 1949, had increased to 5.8 million. Investment in the military and naval industries, as well as the manufacturing of weapons and military equipment, grew by 60% in 1951 and 40% in 1952. By comparison, government investment in the non-military sectors of the Soviet economy grew at a rate of 6% in 1951 and 7% in 1952. Stalin remained in power until his last days. Even with some internal peace, he kept up his usual method of ruling, with arrests, purges, and relocation of people. His actions testify to a relentless effort to hold on to power until he reached the ultimate obstacle, death. The final stage of his journey began on the night of February 28, 1953, Saturday. He invited his four closest comrades at the time, Malenkov, Beria, Khrushchev, and Bulganin, to his home for his life's last dinner meeting. The next day, his bodyguards found him paralyzed. The agony over whether to call in members of the highly suspect medical profession began. On March 2, the doctors confirmed the worst, a stroke brought the old man to the brink of death. For the first time in many decades, and entirely unexpected, the USSR was facing a transfer of power at the highest level.
Like Lenin, Stalin had neither appointed a successor, nor created a legal mechanism for an orderly transfer of power. The Soviet leaders, sure that Stalin would not recover, were stepping in to change the supreme power system he had established. Stalin remained in a serious condition for a few days. On March the 5th, he died. Prior to his passing, the group closest to the Soviet leader settled matters of state and arranged the funeral rites. They decided to move the sarcophagus with Stalin's embalmed body to Lenin's mausoleum. For a while, the Soviet leaders were genuinely alike and united in their resolution to prevent another tyrant from emerging. They backed away from some of Stalin's arrests, harsher decisions, and started to grant relative freedom to the outside world. They were pushed in this direction not only by their conscience, but also by the growing crisis, already visible under Stalin's rule. The death of the man who had been reluctant to entertain any discussion of change paved the way for faster reforms. For three days, starting on March the 6th, 1953, the Soviet Union ceremonially bid farewell to Joseph Stalin. Thousands of people attended his wake, and some were trampled to death amid the crowds. But what made Stalin have support for so long? Author Oleg Klepniuk points to the improved living conditions of the part of the population in rural and urban centers. The victory in World War II, paid for with 27 million lives, made Stalin be seen as a savior, besides the fear of a possible third global conflict. Not to mention the purges, imprisonments, and shootings. The victims of the regime did not necessarily turn into willing opponents. Terror often had the opposite effect. Intimidation made people more subdued and governable, forcing them to prove their loyalty. Finally, he draws a connection between the discontent of today's Russians with the country's rulers about high social inequality and corruption. Will historical ignorance, bitterness, and social discontent create fertile soil for pro-Stalinist lies and distortions to take root? Born on December the 18th, 1878, Joseph Stalin was a Georgian-born Soviet Communist Revolutionary and politician. He ruled the Soviet Union USSR, from the mid-1920s until his death, serving as General Secretary of the Communist Party from 1922 to 1952, as well as Prime Minister of his country from 1941 to 1953 originally presiding over a one-party state that ruled through a collective leadership system he consolidated his power by becoming the dictator or autocrat of the soviet union as early as the 1930s he was ideologically tied to lenin's interpretation of marxism and helped formalize these ideas as marxism leninism while his own policies became known as stalinism this is the story of a young man from georgia the son of a shoemaker Although his circumstances were humble, he managed to enter a theological school in Tbilisi. Over the following years, he would become a leading figure in one of history's greatest revolutions, which changed the 20th century. To this day, it continues to shape the course of events. His name is most remembered as a black legend, a dictator who headed for several decades the world's first socialist country, Joseph Stalin. Was he a dictator, a genocidal tyrant, or a pragmatic leader. This is what we will see. Stalin's childhood and adolescence were apparently typical of the environment from which he came from, the world of poor but not deprived artisans and shopkeepers in a small town on the outskirts of the empire. It was a world in which crude social customs coexisted with the traditional habit of neighbors helping one another, with good times alternating with periods of hardship. To keep him from going to theological school, his parents struggled, but they were helped by friends and family. The young man was treated with rudeness and affection by both his father and mother. Evidence of Stalin's emotions toward his father, who died young, is limited. Yet, by all accounts, he felt genuine affection for his mother. His letters to her in later years contain lines like, Hello, dear mama. How are you? How are you feeling? Stalin had a real debt of gratitude to her. She toiled hard to protect her son from need, allowing him to receive an education 
and cared for him during many illnesses, including smallpox, which scarred his face for the rest of his life. His childhood did not turn him into a rebel, as many biographies would have it. He had his dignity and stood up to his classmates. He had a good memory, but he had two fingers of his left foot stuck together. Not only that, his left arm had weak joints and never worked fully. From 1888 to 1894, he spent almost six years at the Gori Theological School. He was a model student and even received a scholarship. He had a good reputation for excellent prayer reading and singing in the church choir, getting along well with the professors. He graduated in 1894 and earned an excellent grade in many subjects. His academic success secured him a recommendation to enter a theological seminary. At this school, he also learned Russian. In September 1894, having succeeded in passing the entrance examination, young Joseph enrolled in the Tbilisi Theological Seminary. Due to his background, he was awarded housing and meals as a grant, and only had to pay for his clothes and courses. He spent another four years in the seminary. He was now in a major city with different customs, but he still had the company of some of his friends from Gori. He also received an excellent grade on his certificate. Life in the seminary was hard. The discipline was extremely strict. The students were constantly under surveillance, and to pass the time, the young man read Georgian literature and tried to write some verses. After his third year in the seminary, his grades gradually dropped. Increasingly, he was caught breaking the rules quite frequently. He was also reading forbidden books by the seminary, such as Victor Hugo's novels. He started attending a debate group and became increasingly interested in politics. His official biography states that, in August 1898, while still enrolled in the seminary, Joseph joined a social democratic organization and took up work as a propagandist for small labor groups. During this time, his knowledge of Marxism was superficial but he became more interested in it. In fact, Marxism was spreading like an epidemic in Europe. He was eventually kicked out of the seminary in 1899, and although he was considered a rebel, he earned a certificate of excellence for the four years he studied in the seminary. Later, in 1899, Joseph was hired, with the help of friends, to work at the Tbilisi weather station. His duties entailed the constant recording of instrumental readings, which required him to reside there, solving his need for both money and housing. He soon became affiliated with the radical wing of Tbilisi's social democratic organization, which disavowed agitation through legal propaganda, and instead preferred the promotion of strikes and protests. Between 1900 and 1901, Tbilisi experienced a wave of strikes, harshly repressed by the empire. Joseph quit his job and went underground. It was the beginning of his life as a revolutionary when he was only 22. The Russian Empire was a social unjust system, rife with ethnic conflicts and authoritarianism under the Romanov dynasty. Joseph was born in the most conflict-ridden area where ethnic conflicts were prevalent. While not taking responsibility for the burden of his choices, the Caucasus region in which he lived was a vast frontier between the regime's obscurantism and the bloodlust of many revolutionaries. He evaded an arrest for some time, making it possible for him to climb up to the party hierarchy. In 1902, he moved to Batumi, where he staged several strikes and protests, which were harshly repressed. Joseph was eventually imprisoned. He was locked up for a year and a half, he appealed several times against his arrest, but was only released in the fall of 1903. He was sent into exile in eastern Siberia, where he remained for only a brief time. He escaped early in 1904. Over the two years that Joseph spent in prison and exile, the Social Democratic Party of Russia experienced major changes. While it was still formally a single party, it was divided between Lenin's followers, the Bolsheviks, and the Mensheviks, who were more moderate. Lenin had his own vision of a socialist revolution. He believed that the workers were unprepared. They would need professional revolutionaries teaching the workers how to enter the revolution. According to him, this would speed up historical time, and Russia would move from a backward stage to communism, without undergoing a bourgeois revolution. This movement came to be called Marxism-Leninism. As for the Mensheviks, they had a more orthodox Marxist vision. For them, it was necessary to follow Karl Marx's dictates, 
the revolutionary process ought to be gradual and organic, first getting rid of Tsarism, then spreading bourgeois revolution, followed by the industrialization of Russia, and only then reaching communism. Joseph was more attracted to Lenin's vision, embracing radical revolution. The first Russian Revolution, in 1905, intensified the dissension between the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks initially, but ended up uniting the two sides even more. Both groups were facing a common enemy, the government and its supporters. They increasingly resorted to violence and brutality. Mensheviks and Bolsheviks started to act in different areas. Joseph left for Georgia and started assisting strikes and protests, writing pamphlets and articles. He helped in setting up an underground printing shop and militant groups. In October 1905, after the Bloody Sunday and the mutiny on the battleship Potemkin, Tsar Nicholas II was required to make concessions. Russia received its first parliament, the Duma. Political freedoms were proclaimed, along with labor benefits. But the revolutionaries pressed on with their plans. At that point, Mensheviks and Bolsheviks united again. But during the Congresses, the Bolshevik deputies lost heavily to the Mensheviks. The exception was Joseph, who managed to get himself elected. Voting was held abroad for security reasons. Because of this, Joseph gained an insight into the world and made many new connections. In 1906, he married Ekaterina Svanditsa. Their first child was born in March 1907 and was named Yakov. After a million-dollar robbery in Tbilisi, the Mensheviks sent Joseph to Baku. Ekaterina eventually died there, and the couple's infant son was adopted by his maternal grandparents. The 1905 revolution instilled fear in the Russian elites. The Tsar was forced to give in some concessions. Russia became freer and undertook serious reforms. But as the turmoil subsided, the repression increased. In March 1908, Joseph was arrested again. He claimed he did not belong to any political organization, but he was not successful. He ended up in exile again, this time in Vologda. He stayed there for four months until he managed to escape. In 1909, he returned to Baku, but was arrested once again in 1910. He would have to spend five years in Siberia, but appealed and had his sentence reduced. He went back to Vologda to serve his time and stayed there until 1911. After his release from exile, he scored a meteoric rise within the party, becoming a member of the Central Committee in 1912. As a result, he traveled all over Russia, spending considerable time between Moscow and St. Petersburg. He authored articles, published Bolshevik newspapers, and strategized. Joseph stood for a unified party without ethnic divisiveness. He considered himself an actor on the stage of Imperial Russia, not only in Georgia. Putting his past as a young nationalist and Transcaucasian social democrat behind him, he consciously turned himself into Stalin. He started using the Russian-sounding pseudonym, which epitomized his kinship with the revolutionary movement, right around the time he entered the leadership of the Bolshevik party. Stalin earned his position and reputation as a prominent Bolshevik. His organizational and writing skills, his audacity, steadfastness, cool head, simple taste, adaptability, and devotion to Lenin contributed to his rise to the upper echelons of the hierarchy. His ascent in the party would be cut short in 1913. He ended up in prison again, this time whistleblown by a party insider. He got a four-year sentence in Siberia. The exile years were painful. He was isolated and did not have much contact with the party members. He asked for books and never received any answers. He lacked money, and he more or less accepted his condition. He spent four years in sheer idleness, fishing, and living his life under minus 45 degrees Celsius. It now appeared that the weather was not kind to revolutionaries, that the dream of a socialist revolution would never come true. But with Russia's participation in the Great War, the odds changed. At the end of February 1917, the revolution spontaneously erupted. The revolution burst without warning. It was the outcome of the social unrest caused by almost four years of war. The Tsar and his advisors failed to immediately grasp the seriousness of the situation. Lenin, who was in Switzerland, found out about the revolution by reading about it in Western newspapers 
The news also took a while to reach Stalin in his Siberian exile, since the local authorities, seemingly hoping that the uprising would pass, banned their local newspapers from printing reports from Petrograd. The Tsar's abdication prompted widespread celebrations. His brother, Randuk Michael, was appointed Nicholas's successor. However, he also gave up the throne, ending the monarchy. Stalin was released and made his way to Petrograd. Once in the capital, he found the political power torn apart. The Russian parliament, the Duma, had established a provisional government, mainly made up of Menshevik members, who wanted to establish a parliamentary republic. Meanwhile, a parallel power was forming within the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, a revolutionary body whose authority was backed by the support of insurgent workers. More importantly, soldiers from the Petrograd garrison, wielding an important piece of real power. Members of socialist parties ran the Soviet, the Menshevik Social Democrats, and the Socialist Revolutionaries. These two parties were the most powerful forces within the revolutionary camp. The SRs and the Mensheviks stood poised to determine the short and long-term goals of the revolution. Both parties were firm believers in a bourgeois revolution. The socialist ideal was a distant prospect, whereas the Bolsheviks were sidelined at that point. Both had a pragmatic and realistic view. For the time being, it was ideal to avoid a civil war since it could lead the country to collapse. A policy of compromise was adopted. The provisional government would be supported if it furthered the revolutionary cause. In Switzerland, Lenin wrote against the coalition, advocating a more radical path, declaring war against the provisional government, and championing the socialist revolution. Stalin kept a moderate position. As soon as he heard of the revolution, Lenin hastily prepared to leave Switzerland for Russia. Anxious to enter the arena, he brokered a deal with the German authorities, allowing him to travel to Russia through enemy territory. It is worth remembering that Russia was still at war with Germany, even after the Tsar's fall. When he made this move, Lenin took a serious risk and laid himself open to accusations of colluding with the enemy or even of espionage. But the ends justified the means. He needed to get to Petrograd. As soon as he stepped off the train, he officially announced his course of action. Lenin recommended the rupture of the provisional government. The Bolsheviks would have to promote a break with it to immediately bring about a socialist revolution, nationalizing the land, the banks, and turning the Latifundia into model farms. But Lenin still had no idea how this socialist revolution would take place in Russia, a country that was still too outdated to implement Marx's ideas. One should note that the Bolsheviks still did not have an absolute majority among the revolutionaries. Stalin himself was against it, but Lenin tried to gain allies through conciliation, giving away high-ranking party posts. As a result, Stalin was elected to the Central Committee position. This sudden shift by Stalin is still a mystery to us, as he was not a radical Bolshevik up to that point. Perhaps he needed someone to follow since he was not yet ready to be a leader. With Russia still in the war by the provisional government's decision, the people started to show discontent. This was the fertile soil the Bolsheviks needed to spread their unruling plan. The Bolsheviks needed the right moment to take power. Several marches took place in July and clashes ensued. The Bolsheviks refused to take responsibility for the riots. However, the provisional government ignored this, arrested some Bolshevik members, and Lenin fled to Finland with Stalin's help. Stalin, who was hardly known, remained in Petrograd. Stalin wanted to strengthen the party ranks. Kerensky, the leader of the provisional government, quarreled with the army chief and increasingly lost support. Between September and October, Lenin returned to Petrograd. The time had come to seize power. The remaining part of the trio, Trotsky, was missing. He had been one of the Soviet leaders of the 1905 revolution, after that, he had spent most of his life in the United States, in exile. His ideas constantly clashed with Lenin's, but they agreed on one thing. The time had come for a socialist revolution in Russia. He returned to his country in May 1917, and his affection for Lenin was natural. He quickly found himself at the heart of events. By September, he was the leader of the Petrograd Soviet, playing a central role in the insurrection. According to the author, Stalin may have been a bit envious of Trotsky's meteoric rise, 
but he had two things that Stalin craved. He was a good orator, capable of bewitching the masses, and he had brilliant, engaging writing, as opposed to Stalin's boring speeches and texts, void of rallying slogans or catchphrases. In the early hours of October 26, 1917, the Bolsheviks arrested members of the Provisional Government and established their own Soviet of People Commissars, with Lenin as chair. Stalin was named People's Commissar for Nationalities. The Provisional Government was overthrown and succeeded by a Bolshevik Council of People's Commissars. In January 1918, the Constituent Assembly was disbanded. In March 1918, a separate, humiliating and devastating peace agreement with Germany was signed. Before long, Russia entered a civil war. Members of the middle and upper classes, known as the White Army, persecuted socialists and peasants, enraged by the confiscation of the crops, were aligning against the Bolsheviks. Russia's former allies, France and England, also entered the conflict, funding the White Army. The objective was to avoid bringing the revolution to a conclusion. The carnage swept over Russia between 1918 and 1920. The Civil War far exceeded Russian casualties during World War I and the February Revolution, which were around 2 million people. During the Civil War, 3 million died, followed by a further 5 million from the famine that gripped the country. In the initial stages of the Civil War, Stalin, who up until then had no experience in the army, took command of a detachment in the city of Saritsyn, later Stalingrad. After some setbacks, he embarked on a series of persecutions and purges, eliminating those deemed bourgeois and loyal to the Tsar. Lenin was not Stalin's firing squad, but Trotsky was categorically opposed. For him, this would hinder his project to transform the Red Army into a professional and orderly institution. Stalin fought back and was ready to target Trotsky, but Lenin sided with the latter. With this, Joseph was forced to leave Tsaritsyn, from then on, Stalin spent the rest of his life hating Trotsky. He went on to lead battles in the Crimea and Lviv, both of which failed. Faced with a lack of a convincing victory, he returned to Moscow and never resumed military action. Faced with the Red Army's defeats in Poland, Stalin issued a memorandum to the party calling for military reserves, expanded military output, and the formation of new units. This was Stalin's effort to put defeat on Trotsky's shoulders, the army's top leadership. Trotsky promptly responded, proposing the formation of a supply council, giving Stalin to take part. This was a come and get it approach. Joseph replied in a short and blunt note, I hereby declare that I cannot, and consequently will not, work in the supply council envisaged by Trotsky. Some days later, the two, together with party members and Lenin, would meet. Stalin had his proposals rejected and witnessed Trotsky's new impetus. He was doing a decent job on the military reserve forces. Lenin clearly sided with Trotsky. On September the 20th, a plenary session of the Central Committee issued a decision to send Stalin on a long-term mission to the Caucasus. He was given the task of establishing relations with the Montagnards and bringing order to politics in the Caucasus and in the East, Soviet Asia. The Bolsheviks came out of the Civil War as victorious. However, the country was depleted. Lenin's attempt to establish communism all at once failed. The economy was crippled. Many sectors rebelled. Between 1921 to 1922, thousands perished from starvation. The solution was to backtrack on the revolutionary project, and NEP was implemented. The economic policy implemented some capitalist practices in the country, but the states continued to control the economy. As a result of NEP, Russia moved away from the brink of the precipice in just a few years. Lenin enjoyed absolute leadership, Trotsky cast a shadow, while Stalin was in danger of becoming a second-rank official. He went on to run two agencies, the Commissariat for Nationalities and the General Inspection of Workers and Rural Workers. He found this work unpleasant and asked to leave several times. Finally, in 1921, he succeeded. From 1921 on, Lenin's health was severely impaired. He experienced headaches, fatigue, and bouts of paralysis. As a result of his illness, Trotsky was rising as a leader. But Stalin held to Lenin and stopped this from happening 
In 1922, Stalin was appointed to the newly created Office of General Secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. He would run the bureaucratic apparatus that implemented the party's wishes. Many mid-level functionaries now depended on Stalin for their careers. For this role, Stalin felt quite comfortable. While we see in school and textbooks that the trio, Lenin, Trotsky and Stalin, were inseparable, this was not quite the case. The three complemented each other during the revolution, but all had their ego feuds. However, the closest relationship was between Lenin and Stalin. The two would even exchange jokes. During the most difficult period of his illness, Lenin turned to Stalin. On the other hand, Trotsky could be a threat to both, and was quite stern, inflexible, and secretive. Stalin wanted greater centralization in Moscow, bringing the republics together, while making it clear that the orders would come from the Russian capital. Lenin opposed this. He wanted a union of the republics, but with greater autonomy. Stalin gave in. He knew Lenin well, and appreciated how powerful he still was. A new clash took place shortly after. Lenin became closer to Trotsky, as he knew very well how to handle the party's infighting. The pinnacle of the quarrel between Lenin and Stalin was when he censured the leader's wife. Poignantly ill as he was, Lenin still sent a menacing message, and the two almost severed ties. It is hard to say if Lenin was willing to break with Stalin. For him, it was more of a political maneuver since his health was waning, and he did not want to appear weak. His party authority depended on unquestioning loyalty among officials and rivalries between party leaders. With this mechanism, Stalin was the ideal counterweight to the ambitions of other Bolshevik leaders, as well as an irreplaceable trustee. Lenin's actions were all part of a rebalancing that called for a decrease in Stalin's power. Stalin, although aggrieved, did not take Lenin's attitude too personally. He blamed it on the illness. But, within the Politburo, a fierce battle would rage, especially after Lenin's death in January 1924. Two other friends, Bukharin and Zinoviev, quickly accused Stalin. They said that he did not contribute to the party collectivity and wanted to make his own decisions. The first critical episode came in 1923, with the German crisis. Stalin was against fomenting a socialist revolution in that country at the time. On the other hand, Trotsky, Bukharin, and Zinoviev were excited about pursuing the revolution in other countries. Faced with this, Joseph stepped forward, summoned the partisans to a meeting, distancing himself from the idea that he would not discuss the decisions. At the meeting, Stalin wanted to hear the proposal. He warned that, if the offensive were carried out wrongly, the Germans would win, and the entire revolution would collapse. He wanted the Soviet Union to seriously prepare for war. Trotsky wanted the strike to happen, believing that they would not get another chance. But Stalin's pragmatism prevailed. He convinced them that the Soviet Union was not ready and that a defeat would be the end. The next step in Trotsky's decline in power occurred in September. Stalin was chosen by the party as leader in the military administrative councils, Trotsky's domain. Historians are unsure how the arrangement was orchestrated, but the logic is simple. As the leader of the Red Army and highly charismatic, Trotsky could very well lead the troops and launch an attack on Germany or even seize power. Taking control of the Red Army was extremely important for the party members. Nothing better than to bring it under the control of Trotsky's chief opponent. In October 1923, resentful and isolated, Trotsky unleashed a counterattack. He stated that the committee was now making wrong and noxious decisions. He was a lure magnet to attract dissatisfied party members. The polarization between Stalin and Trotsky escalated over the next two years. After Lenin's death in January 1924, they gathered at the Congress in May, where the leader's will was read, smoothing out any jabs at Stalin. By the end of the Congress, Stalin was re-elected General Secretary. Once elected, he started reforming the party's structure and attracting allies. He did not want to budge one inch from his decisions, but he also did not want to appear authoritarian. Like a good student, he followed Lenin's tactics and toyed with the vanities of his supporters. He succeeded against Trotsky due to the collective leadership system that he set up between the Soviet leaders and government entities. The collective leadership period was a fruitful time of decision-making and prosperity for the NEP, 
Nevertheless, the collective leadership started to crumble when the government took a more radical and hardline tack. As he set up the collective government, Stalin could pull it apart. As Stalin gradually set up a network of influences within the Politburo, Trotsky became increasingly isolated and was removed from the Central Committee and a plenary session in October 1927. During the same period, the 10th anniversary of the revolution was being commemorated. Opponents tried to stage their own marches and demonstrations, rivaling the official ones, but were repressed. Some were imprisoned or deported. Trotsky, who continued to oppose Stalin, was sent to Kazakhstan and later expelled from the Soviet Union. The Russian Revolution, like the French one, was starting to devour its children. Stalin was making a critical decision. No opposition would be condoned, and no collective leadership was necessary. But the Great Repression would come in the 1930s. If the political regime was slowly getting tougher, the economy was improving increasingly due to the NEP. Commercial and agricultural output succeeded in supplying the population's most fragile sectors. Nonetheless, some members of the Politburo were critical of the benefits given to members of the bourgeoisie, but the time was not yet ripe to cancel the NEP. Meanwhile, capitalist nations started to fight back against the Soviet Union's growing influence. The United Kingdom was the first, severing diplomatic relations, and then the Soviet ambassador was assassinated in Poland. Stalin feared the escalation of a new conflict or the spread of an internal monarchist treason. Accordingly, he has to plan to arrest and even shoot members of the old aristocracy. After eliminating the opposition within the party, the first plenum of the Central Committee took place in December 1927. Now that the opposition had been crushed, it was a suitable time to fulfill Lenin's wishes. He said he was a tough man, something necessary up to that point. But from then on, that would change. As Stalin expected, the plenum rejected his resignation. This move paid him important political gains. As a stern leader, he was the driving force behind the defeat of the opposition, reassuring the rest of the leadership with this display of non-attachment to power. He proved that he was working towards a collective government. After this daring strategy, he increasingly asserted himself as leader, or rather, as dictator. Stalin had a secretive personality, but in his private life, he loved to read, particularly party documents and memoranda. Some say he read between 400 and 500 pages a day. As expected, he studied Marx and Engels, was fond of the former, and was later critical of the latter's writings. In his private library, he had 397 favorite items, 72 of which were Lenin's. The Bolshevik leader was his greatest inspiration, even more than Marx. Stalin hardly ever made a speech without quoting Lenin. He also loved history, considering it a way to legitimize his own policies. He was inspired by two Tsars, Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great. They consolidated and expanded Russia, developed its military power, and fought relentlessly against internal enemies. Now we can understand why. He also loved cinema and promoted the Soviet film movement, as well as the artistic trend known as Soviet realism intending to bring to the masses what they should be, while distracting them from the difficulties and exhorting the virtue of putting the party and the state above one's own interests. By the end of 1927, the NEP was giving signs of exhaustion. It was necessary to change this economic plan with industrialization. But for many, this plan had to be done according to socialist molds. The liberalization of capital carried out under the NEP had to be discontinued. But doing this meant that the peasants had to sell their grain directly to the state, something that they would not do willingly. In early 1928, he made a long trip to Siberia to convince the local leaders to deliver grain. If this were hidden, repression would be necessary. In a single month, Siberia met one-third of its annual quota. Underlying the impressive figures was the violence used by the agents. The countryside was swamped with raids and arrests. Upon his return to Moscow, he encountered some opposition within the Politburo, but he did not decide to confront it outright, instead adopting deception, patience, and subversion as a countermeasure. Stalin was still lacking enough power and allies to get rid of his opponents, 
Any leader who openly threatened the party's newly revived unity would find himself in an unpopular position. How could Stalin strive for dominance without undercutting the Union? There was but one solution, sneakily trigger a split, and then position himself as an aggrieved supporter of the Union and his enemies as the schismatics. All this was the script that Stalin followed. The Politburo was led by Stalin, but divided between two groups. One led by Bukharin, who disavowed the extreme grain confiscation measures, and another minority of Stalin's friends and loyal followers. In 1928, using political intrigue, Stalin managed to weaken Bukharin's group and build unity among his followers. He probably took advantage of his opponent's mistakes and resorted to blackmail, finding police documents of party members who worked with the authorities before the revolution. In July 1928, Bukharin met with Kamenev and provided him with a forthright account of the conflicts during up the Politburo. Kamenev's written account of this conversation was stolen and sent to Trotsky's followers, who, despising both Stalin and Bukharin, were glad to have the report printed in pamphlets and distributed publicly. The true story has yet to be fully clarified. Even if Stalin and the secret police, already under his control, had nothing to do with the stealing of the notes, it is beyond doubt that he did everything he could to ensure that the pamphlets were widely disseminated. Bukharin and his supporters were hopelessly compromised. Bukharin came to be known as a dissident who consorted with the defeated opposition behind the back of his Politburo colleagues. Together with this scandal, Stalin cranked up the propaganda machine. Methodically and persistently, he peddled the idea that he would destroy the rightists within the party. This was how the victory of socialism and the long-awaited overcoming of difficulties and conflicts would finally be achieved. This simple idea was a magnet for smaller officials within the party. Most party members, each for their own reasons, switched to supporting Stalin. Between 1929 and 1930, Bukharin and his allies were thrown out of the Politburo and demoted to second-tier official status. None of them survived the terror. Stalin's victory in the Politburo stemmed from political intrigue and blunder by his opponents. The general secretary used his vast experience, building and handling the power and influence he had acquired during the years of dispute with Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. Also, the importance of Stalin's power as general secretary to influence appointments cannot be underestimated. He knew how to maneuver people, how to wait for the right moment, and strike with precisely the right force to avoid frightening away potential or unwitting supporters. While disguising his true intentions, he presented himself as a reasonable politician and a loyal member of the party community, unforgiving only against his enemies. Everything would be different in a few years. Many of those who supported Stalin deeply regretted their choice when it was their turn to face annihilation. This was Stalin's genius, ensuring that his victims would only develop regret when it's too late. The outcome of Stalin's faction's victory was a clear path for the great industrialization leap. He put all his effort and money into purchasing machinery and factories for the push. He even benefited from the 1929 crisis, as the Western countries preferred to cooperate with the Soviet Union. After all, they needed money. The age of the five-year plans had begun. In the first part of our documentary on Stalin, we have seen his journey from Georgia to total power in the Soviet Union. In the second part, we will look at the consolidation of his rule, his leadership in the Second World War, and his final days during the Cold War.